Our next session is Section 8, and we are still on the general surgical nursing management of patients with sensory neural organs problems. And the session seeks to introduce students to the management of cataract, trauma, and tumor of the eye. The eye, as we all know, is a sensitive organ and the nurse must endeavor to offer the needed psychological care during eye surgeries. The outline include definition, incidence, causes, classification, signs and symptoms, and management of these conditions. Students are expected to be able to explain cataracts mention some factors that contribute to trauma and tumor of the eye, prepare and care for patients undergoing cataract, eye trauma, and tumor surgeries. So our first topic is cataracts. Now, what is cataract? Before we move on to cataract, I'm referring you to anatomy and physiology. Look at the structure of the eye, the eye, as we all know, is the organ of sight, and it's spherical with a hollow globe filled with fluids, humors. It has three layers. The outer layer, which consists of sclera and cornea, is fibrous and protective in nature. And the middle layer, which is a choroid, which involves structures such as choroid, ciliary body, and the iris, is vascular in nature and then we have the innermost layer where the retina which is the nervous or sensory part of the eye is located so that is the diagram or anatomical structure of the eye in the picture now to continue with the eye the lens the only solid structure inside the eye is a clear portion of the eye and it focuses rays on rays of light entering the eye onto the retina. So the fluid, we know we have vitreous humor and then aqueous humor. And please revise the mechanism of vision as learned in anatomy and physiology. So now we come to our main topic and that is cataract. Cataract is an opacity of the clear, transparent and crystalline lens that distorts the image projected onto the retina and that can progress to blindness. It usually starts with one eye and then later the other. And it's not contagious and cannot spread from person to person and does not cause the eye to tear abnormally. It's neither painful nor make the eye itch or red. The incidence of almost half of the world's vision loss or impairments occurs as a result of cataracts, according to WHO. And cataracts is said to be responsible for at least half of total vision loss in most developing countries. Most cataracts are related to aging and very common in older people. And it is ranked behind only arthritis and heart diseases as a leading cause of disability in older adults. The prognosis with cataract vision may not improve to 20 to 20 after surgery if other eye diseases such as macular degeneration are present. And in patients who have intraocular lens replacement, 90% have 20 over 40 vision or better. And in some patients, who have extra capsular surgery, part of the lens capsule eventually becomes cloudy, causing a condition called after cataract. Causes of cataract. The actual cause is unknown or we say is idiopathic, but there are certain predisposing factors, and these include aging, genetic, and congenital as a complication of other diseases like diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, glaucoma, and uvitis. Trauma 
may also result in perforating injury which damages the eye or even touches the lens and will cause a localized opacity at the point of the contact or point of contact. The prolonged use of certain drugs such as corticosteroids may also result in that in opacity of the lungs, exposure to radiation or extreme heat such as x-rays or strong light, and then nutrient deficiency, examples vitamins A, B, or C deficiency. Cataracts may be classified according to maturity, and with that we may have immature cataracts in which there's slight lens opacity. It causes little or no vision loss. The mature cataract has total lens opacity, and it results in vision loss. Then lastly, we have the hypermature cataract, in which there's degeneration, total degeneration of the lens. It may also be classified according to position or opacity. And sub, under that, we have subcapsular cataracts, where there's, there's cloudiness in the capsule of the lens, diabetes, and those taking high doses of steroid medications are at a greater risk. We also have nuclear cataract, and it forms deep in the central zone or nucleus of the lens, and is usually associated with aging. And we have cortical cataract, which occurs in the lens cortex, or part of the lens that surrounds the central nucleus. It leads to formation of white wedge-like opacities. Then we also have classification according to aging. And under this, we have degenerative cataract. It's the most common form of cataract. And is due to destructive process which occurs in the lungs, in the agent. We also have congenital or juvenile cataract. And it occurs most often in infants whose mothers had a history of viral infections like German measles. So a brief pathophysiology. The lens is made mostly of water and protein fibers. And the, these protein fibers are arranged in a precise manner that makes the lens clear and allows light to pass through without interference. Aging or other factors cause the lens to undergo structural changes and this may lead to denaturing of the protein fibers. These fibers then clamp together, causing cloudiness of the lens, and the cloudiness prevents transparency of the lens. And the loss of transparency or opacity formation is what we call cataract. Now the clinical manifestations. There may be painless blood vision, Vision is blurred, but then patient does not experience any pain. There's also decreased loss of color intensity and perception. Patients may have double vision. This is known as diplopia or multiple vision, known as polyopia. There's reduced visual acuity, difficulty seeing at night, and seeing halos around light, and then being sensitive to glare. Diagnoses include history taken, medical and ocular, visual acuity test, visual field test, ophthalmoscopy, slit lamp by microscopic examination, tonometry, and ocular examination. The management. There's no non-surgical treatment cures for cataracts. If vision impairment does not interact with normal activities, surgery may not be recommended. Age-related cataracts. With this one, contact lenses, strong bifocals or magnifying lenses may improve vision. And the goal of surgical management is normally geared towards restoring visual function through a safe and minimally invasive procedure. So the types of surgeries that may be performed include intracapsular extraction, removal of the, this entails the removal of the entire lens. 
extra capsular extraction entails the removal of a portion of the lens nucleus and cortex, leaving the posterior capsule intact. Then we may also have lens replacement. And this is affectic in this affectic eye glasses, contact lens, and intraocular lens or implants may be done. Now complications. Patients may end up having rupturing of posterior capsule. It results in intraocular pressure. There's vitreous loss and vision loss as well. Patient may have dislodgement of the lens, prolapse of the iris, there may be hemorrhage or bleeding, and then there's a gap in at the incisional site postoperatively. So all these are post-op complications. Now the pre-op preparation. We mentioned a few things here since we've already done the general pre- and post-op management of patients undergoing eye surgeries. Remember, shave, uh, shave la lashes, our eyelashes are shaved as necessary. Patients should wash the face. The specific eye is labeled or identified and then prescribed antibiotics, corticosteroids and anti-inflammatory medications are given. The eye may also be dilated with prescribed medications such as mydiatrics. The eye is protected, patient is provided with verbal and written instructions as to how to protect the eye, administration of medications, recognizing complications is also important, and then patient is taught how to obtain or the need to obtain emergency care. Then postoperatively, patient is observed for intraocular pressure, signs of bleeding, the shield is removed as well as the pad and eye is cleaned with normal saline and gauze and post-testing for vision is important. On the third day or one week, if you observe for intraocular pressure, check for bleeding at the anterior chamber, observe for signs of infection, check for signs of retinal detachment and then test for post-operative vision as well. Other post-operative instructions for patients include hand washing before applying ointments or drops and patient is asked to avoid sleeping on the affected side or avoid or limit strenuous activities at least for one week for one or two weeks and then avoid chewing hard food such as bones, sugar cane to mention a few and to prevent increased pressure on the eye. He or she is asked to avoid rubbing or pressing the eye and avoid using cold or warm pads to dab the eye in cases of itching. Then patient is also told to wipe tears with clean soft tissue and not handkerchief and clean the face with a soft face towel but do not rub face with hands during washing of the face. And so the beard is not supposed to be shaved for one week in men. And this is only in men. And patients is avoid to desist from washing hair or using hair dryer for two weeks, especially in women. Patients is told to avoid bending head below knee level. He or she is also advised to use sunglasses to protect the eye for about eight weeks and he or she is also taught follow-up visits and review. Our next topic, which is topic two, is tumor of the eye. Tumor of the eye can be benign or malignant and once again you are being referred to surgery, malignancies or neoplasms under surgery. It may be benign or malignant and it may affect any structure of the eye. It normally occurs during childhood and could be a primary tumor of the eye or a metastatic tumor. Students 
once again, I have been asked to review notes on cancers in NES 234. The actual cause of these tumors may be unknown, that is idiopathic, but we may have predisposing factors such as poor immune system, sun exposure to sunlight or sun, and then some occupations such as in a welders, farmers, fishermen, chemical workers, and laundry workers may be predisposed. Then types of eye cancers include the melanoma, lymphoma, and then retinoblastoma or retinoblastoma. Melanoma develops most commonly in the uvea or iris, choroid, ciliary body. And then we may also have choroidal melanoma and this can cause astigmatism, far-sighted vision, flashing lights and floaters, and two different types of cells may be isolated, epithelialoid and then spindled. Lymphoma, on the other hand, begins in lymph nodes and two types that are commonly known are the Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's and then poor, we also have poor immune system and this predisposes individuals to lymphoma. Retinoblastoma is common in children. In the picture we have a child who has started developing retinoblastoma. And the causes are unknown. If you look at the left eye of the child, the causes are unknown. Vitamin D may prevent the spread of cancer cells. Diagnosis of this tumor, routine eye examinations are done through ophthalmoscopy, the use of a split lamp, and then ultrasound can also be done. Fluorescing and geography may be done fine needle biopsy where the samples of tissues are taken from the tumor site and then testing for metastasis may be done. Treatment is based on location and size. Surgery may be done. We may also have radiation, laser, chemotherapy may be required and then monoclonal antibodies in lymphoma. Now our last and third topic is trauma to the eye. We've already stated that or discussed that the eye is a sensory organ which helps us to see and therefore any damage to the eye can cause vision loss. Eye trauma refers to damage caused by a direct blow to the eye and the trauma may affect not only the eye but the surrounding area including adjacent tissue and bone structure. There are many different forms of trauma and it varies in severity from minor injury to medical emergencies. When the eye is hit with a blunt force, it suddenly compresses and then it retracts. And this can cause blood to collect under the hit area, which leads to many of the common symptoms of eye trauma. So this is an example of a trauma to the eye, as you can see in the picture. Diagnostic investigations for eye trauma include CT scan, because it may help identify foreign bodies, pathological conditions, or orbital wall fracture. It also helps in evaluating the integrity of the globe. X-rays may be done. This helps in identifying intraocular foreign body or orbital wall fracture, fundus autofluorescence, and with this changes in the retinal pigment, epithelium secondary to trauma may all be identified. MRI scanning may be done. Fluorescence and geography is done to isolate areas of choroidal neuro, uh, neovascularization secondary to choroidal ruptures. And then optic coherence tomography is also done to isolate the presence of macular holes. Ophthalmoscopy may also 
be done. Now the treatment for eye trauma. Treatment normally varies with the type of injury and it normally starts with observation and topical antibiotics or flushing. Systemic antibiotics such as vancomycin may be given in adults and it's given intravenously every 12 hours and ceftazidim sodium may also be given 500 to 2,000 milligrams intravenously to adults 8 to 12 hours. Stitching or suturing of the eye may be done for eyelid lacerations. Then in high femur, we may have a high femur. Surgical treatment is indicated when the high femur is complicated by corneal blood staining and elevated intraocular pressure, which threatens the optic nerve. Or if spontaneous blood resorption is too slow to allow treatment of retinal pathology, surgery is 20 times more likely to be required if there is re-bleeding. Now for open globe injury, for those injuries that require surgery, prompt repair by an ophthalmic specialist is crucial, especially within 24 hours and prolapsed iris or choroid need to be replaced or removed prior to closure of the wound. If a radial laceration causes dysfunction of the iris, sphincter muscle, surgical correction may be considered. So in radial laceration, which causes dysfunction of the iris and sphincter muscles, there may be a need for surgical correction. And then, Pass planar vitrectomy is indicated for significant vitro retinal traction, retinal detachment, and for moderate to severe vitreous hemorrhage. Lensectomy may be required for traumatic cataract or subluxated or dislocated lens. Specific pre op care assess the visual acuity of patients. Then we should, the nurse is expected to assess client support systems and then possible effects of impaired vision on lifestyle and ability to perform ADLs in the post-operative period. Clients should be taught measures to prevent eye injury post-operatively and should avoid vomiting, straining at stool, coughing, sneezing, lifting more than five pounds and bending over at the waist and remove all eye makeup and contact lenses or glasses prior to surgery and store in a safe place. Have glasses readily available for clients on return from surgery and preoperative medications and eye drops or ointments may also be prescribed and administered. The status of the eye dressing following surgery is also monitored or observed and ensure the nurse ensures that the eye patch or eye shield is in place and this helps prevent inadvertent injury to the post or the operative site. The client is placed in a foulless or semi foulless position or laid or asked to lie on the unaffected side and these positions help in reducing intraocular pressure in the affected eye. Potential surgical complications should also be monitored or assessed. And we assess or observe or monitor patient for pain in or drainage from the affected eye, hemorrhage, flashes of light, cloudy appearance to the cornea, that which is an indication that there's corneal edema. And this is evidence of the above manifestations or unusual complaints by the client. And these complaints should be reported promptly. Any unusual complaint should be reported to the physician at once. And there's the need for early intervention to preserve the patient's sight. All personal articles should be placed within reach of patients. And patients should be assisted with early ambulation and personal care activities as needed. Antibiotics, anti-inflammatory and other systemic and eye medications 
are also administered as prescribed and anti-emetic medications are prescribed and administered as needed and it is important to prevent vomiting in order to maintain the normal intraocular pressure. Patient and family teaching is also important. They are taught the proper way to instill eye drops. They are taught the name, dosage, schedule, duration, purpose, and side effects of the post-operative medications, and then the proper use of the eye patch. They are also taught the need to avoid scratching, rubbing, touching, or squeezing the affected eye, and then measures to avoid constipation and draining and activity limitations are also ensured. Symptoms that should be reported to the physician include eye pain or pressure, redness or cloudiness, drainage, decreased vision, floaters or flashes of light or halos around bright objects. They are also told, or patients and family are told, they need to wear sunglasses with side shields when outdoors and photophobia is a common symptom after the eye surgery. So clients should be reminded that normal vision may be impaired or vision may be unstable for several weeks following eye surgery. Then patient may be referred to a community home health agency for assistance with home care after discharge as needed. With contaminated vitreous in, uh, intravitreal antibiotic therapy is done, and then with foreign body, the removal of the foreign body is a priority. The surgical technique for removal of foreign bodies will depend on the number and location of the foreign body in the eye, and the size and shape and composition, as well as the presence of fibrous tissue around the foreign body. Common conditions associated with eye trauma include scratched eye, corneal abrasion, penetrating of foreign objects in the eye, chemical burn, eye swelling, subconjunctival hemorrhages, which is uh, about eye bleeding, and then traumatic iritis, hyphenias, and orbital blowout fractures. All these are common conditions that are associated with eye trauma. So trauma to the eye may cause any of these and these are some of the symptoms. It is important for nurses to assess the vision of all patients so as to identify appropriate measures that can be adopted to identify any abnormalities for early intervention. Students are encouraged to make efforts to care for patients with eye problems in order to enhance their skills in the care of patients with eye problems. So these are the references. You can read or refer to the following as a reading list for further reading. Thank you. Thank you.